This video is a brief review of complex numbers. It corresponds to section 2.4 of the Applied Analog Electronics textbook. We are going to use complex numbers with the notation that electrical engineers use. And that is to say that we're going to use j to be the imaginary number that's the square root of minus 1. Now, mathematicians have been using lowercase i for this for a long time. Electrical engineers, however, chose I for current, and so switched to J for the imaginary number. And because we're going to be doing a lot of stuff where I is going to be current in this class, we'll use the electrical engineering notation, J is the square root of minus one, even though I was trained initially as a mathematician and find J a rather strange choice. Um, okay, what do we do when we do complex numbers? first thing is to realize that there are really a way of representing a two-dimensional system of numbers. We've got the one axis and we've got the J axis. And we can write a point in space here or on the plane as X plus J Y. And that's uh, the way of representing it in Cartesian coordinates where we have a pair of real numbers to represent a point on the plane. By representing it as a real part and an imaginary part, we do get some extra power, and that's why complex numbers um, exist as a system. Okay, um, there is another way to represent this number, and that is we can talk about how far it is from zero. And what's the angle that we make with respect to the real axis? This is known as polar notation. And there's an interesting relationship between polar notation and Cartesian notation known as Euler's formula. And that is that if we write a times e to the j theta, that is equal to, switch over to Cartesian coordinates, a times cosine of theta plus j times a sine theta. Basically, if we look at what x and y are here, if theta is in radians, oh, that's an important point here, all these uh, computations here, theta is in radians. If we wanted to do angles in degrees, we would have to scale them, where um, pi radians is equal to 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if you look at this point, x plus jy, well, x is a times cosine theta. Well, a is the hypotenuse here. We've got um, Cartesian coordinate system here, so this is a nice right angle. We have definition of cosine is this length here is a cosine theta. This length here is a sine theta. So this point is represented this way in Cartesian coordinates and this way in polar coordinates. And this relationship is a really powerful one. It allows us, for instance, to do almost all the trigonometric identities that you had to memorize in, in a pre-calculus class. They're just consequences of this. We can, for instance, write out what happens if we want to add two angles. All right. So I'm going to take Euler's formula there. And let's see, I can get a little bit more on that page still. And what we want to look at is what is e to the j times theta plus phi. Well, just from the definition of exponentiation, we can get that this is e times j theta times e times j phi. We can do conversion on each side here into... Cartesian coordinates. Taking the left-hand side there, we're going to get cosine of 
theta plus phi plus j times sine of theta plus phi. Okay, um, and that's going to be equal to, now looking over on this other side, cosine theta plus j sine theta times cosine phi plus j sine phi. So I've just applied Euler's formula to each one of these exponentials, converting everything from polar coordinates to Cartesian coordinates. Now I can multiply this thing out, it's just algebra, and I get this is equal to, I'm going to do the two real parts first, cosine theta, cosine phi, and then now I'll do the two imaginary parts. The j times j is minus 1, so I'm just going to get minus sine theta sine phi, and now I'll do the two cross terms. Um, so I'll have j times sine theta cosine phi, and I'll also have cosine theta sine phi. And what we've got here is the real part is equal to the real part there, the imaginary part here is equal to the imaginary part here, and we've got the formulas, uh, the trigonometric formulas for cosine of, the, of adding two angles or the sine of adding two angles. And we didn't have to do any memory work of trigonometric identities. It's just Euler's formula up at the top here and very straightforward algebra. Euler's formula does a lot of magic like that. Not only do we get a lot of trigonometric identities, but notice what happens when we want to multiply two complex numbers. If we've got them in polar notation, well, multiplying them just means multiplying their magnitudes and adding their angles. Incidentally, that angle in um, uh, engineering notation is often referred to as the phase of the polar coordinates here. All right, let's look at one more example um, of sort of magic that you can do with uh, Euler's formula. Let's say we wanted to do something where we had a real valued function that was just cosine of theta. How can we represent that using Euler's formula in terms of exponentials? Well, one way to do it is you could say, well, that's just the real part of e to the j theta. And that's all very nice until you realize that real part of things is not a really nice function for a lot of purposes. Um, and we can do things a little bit nicer than that because I mean, the problem is that if we take the real part of x, y, that's not the same thing as the real part of x times the real part of y. So it doesn't distribute over multiplication. We can, however, by looking at what's e to the minus j theta, we can do some magic. Because this is going to be cosine of minus theta plus j times sine of minus theta. And because cosine is an odd function, cosine of minus theta is the same thing as cosine theta. We can write that as cosine theta. And then sine is an, um, sorry, cosine is an even function, sine is an odd function. Sine is an odd function, so sine of minus theta is minus sine of theta, and we can write this as minus j sine theta. So we've got e to the minus j theta looks a lot like e to the j theta, just negated the, the imaginary part. And if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense, because what we've done is taken this point here, there's theta, and say, well, what happens if we take minus theta? Well, we just go down as much as we went up before, and we're moving across the same amount. So, um, negating the exponent here just negates the imaginary part. 
All right, what can we do with that? Well, let's look at e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta. The real parts, they're both going to be cosine theta, so we're going to get 2 cosine theta. The imaginary parts have opposite signs and are the same magnitude, so they're just going to cancel. And we get e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta is 2 cosine theta, which we could also write as cosine theta equals e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta over 2. We can do a similar thing with subtraction. Let's look at e to the j theta minus e to the minus j theta. Well, we're going to have cosine theta minus cosine theta here, so we're going to have real parts canceling, and we'll have j sine theta minus minus uh, j sine theta, so we'll have 2j sine theta, or sine theta is e to the j theta minus e to the minus j theta over 2j. So that we can represent real value of things like cosines and sines entirely in terms of these exponentials. When we're dealing with linear systems, the output of a linear system, by definition of a linear system, is if you add a bunch of things together, multiply them by constants, you're going to get the output, the outputs added together in the same way, multiplied by the same constants. So if we want to see what a linear system does to cosine theta, we can figure out by figuring out what it does to e to the j theta. And similarly, if we want to know what it does to sine theta, we can figure out by what it does it do to e to the j theta. And so that allows us to do all of our analysis of what does our linear systems do just in terms of what do they do to exponentials. And that turns out to make things very simple because exponentials have really nice properties when you have to take derivatives or integrate them. Exponentials e to the x is the nicest function for differentiating. And we'll look at that a little bit more when we do a review of uh, differential calculus. It's probably all you really need to know about complex numbers for now. Practice them a little bit so that you're comfortable with them. And we'll be using them a lot in this class. Thank you.